Hello, so welcome to one of our in conversations um, on the topic of material methods. So hopefully you've seen the first in the series, um, but just in case not, this is a series of conversations around different projects and different academics who use what might be understood to be material methods. Um, so I'm very excited today. We have a kind of slightly different format and it's a collective, research collective, and um, stitching together with us, which is Emma and Amy. Um, so just to introduce myself, in case you uh, don't know who I am, my name is Sophie Woodward. I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Manchester based in the sociology department. And unsurprisingly, I have an interest in material methods and wrote a book about it this year, which is one of the impetuses for this. Um, so over to Stitching Together, if you'd like to introduce yourselves individually, because I think we'll have lots of chance to talk about the collective today. So my name is Emma Shercliffe and I'm a senior lecturer in textiles um, at the Arts University in Bournemouth. And I'm Amy Twigger Holroyd, I'm Associate Professor of Fashion and Sustainability at Nottingham Trent University. Okay, great, thank you. So a lot of people watching this will be familiar with Stitching Together, some people won't be familiar with it, um, but an obvious place for us to start is if you could uh, tell us about what Stitching Up is, and in particular, given that we're interested in methods here, uh, from the perspective of methods. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we coordinate the Stitching Together network, um, and the network brings together people who facilitate participatory textile making workshops and projects in loads of different settings, including as a form of academic research. And so within our scope, we include every different kind of participatory textile making activity. So that might be uh, knitting, sewing, weaving, crochet, printing, the list goes on and on. Um, and they might be organised in many different ways. So from a short drop-in workshop uh, where people just come along and have a go at something for a, a short time through to really kind of extended projects that might be with a particular group um, over a really long period of time and also activities that are coordinated online. So the, the togetherness of the stitching might be kind of um, uh, virtual, uh, which of course have grown in, in uh, activity a lot in, uh, in recent months. Uh, and through developing the network, we found that textile making activities are being used to explore really diverse research questions um, and to generate da data in really different ways. So we use uh, stitching together and uh, participatory textile making as an umbrella term that describes an approach to research rather than a specific method or even a family of methods. To give some idea of, of the scope and the breadth, um, some of the examples uh, that we've become familiar with uh, might include um, the AHRC funded S4S um, project, um, designing a sensibility for sustainable clothing. Uh, led by Professor Fiona Hackney and her team. And they coordinated uh, a, a variety of textile making workshops as a means to explore attitudes towards garment life cycles. Um, another might include the Social Studio, uh, which is based in Melbourne, Australia, founded by Grace McQuilton. Um, and they offer their routes to training and employment for people from refugee and migrant backgrounds. And uh, what's really interesting about the work that um, researchers have done there is the work highlights how these shared making activities where both researchers and their research subjects teach and learn processes together. So that sharing can challenge some, perhaps the more traditional researcher subject hierarchies. Very interesting to follow up on that. Um, another might be Sarah Brown, uh, a researcher uh, slash embroiderer whose fieldwork in Madagascar involved her using her own skilled sk stitching skills to learn a different craft, that of reed weaving. Um, the socially organised making activities that she was involved in point towards a different quality of interaction with other craftspeople and therefore generate different understandings of the significance of those crafts to, to the people who practice them. And, and to flag up, there are many more examples that we have um, discussed at length and in detail in the um, Stitching Together dedicated two-part special edition of the Journal of Arts and Communities, uh, which will contain 15 case studies 
of different projects in and across two two issues. It's really interesting to hear about that kind of diversity of uses to it and also the kind of global context as well because I think obviously that speaks to a different element of it as well so it's really interesting to hear about that and also maybe points towards some of the potentials for extending it as a method. Um, I'm really interested then to think a little bit about um, you know as you've said it's kind of a, a set of methods but how it is then that you've come to these methods so whether that is either kind of personally or academically or both how it is that you've ended up with this kind of project. Emma and I met while we were both doing our PhDs at different universities um, but around the same time and we discovered this kind of shared approach that we were both um, <coughs> making textiles with people as a, as a kind of means of research. Um, for both of us, this was informed and inspired by previous professional experience as designers and as facilitators of textile making activities. So we kind of moved from a professional experience into a, an academic one. Um, so I'd run my own knitwear label and then branched out into running knitting workshops and projects, which then developed into my research into people's experiences of, of some of those things. Um, and Emma had been working with community groups on a series of participatory projects that included stitched works and rug making. So on a similar, a similar story of really that, that's professional practice kind of raising research questions and, and leading into doctoral research. Um, so yeah, when we started our PhDs, we were bringing those skills and those kind of understandings um, to the projects and found that there wasn't much, if any, literature to help us think about how to develop a methodology um, based on the activities that we knew that we could do and that would generate such interesting stuff, um, like how to generate the data, how to analyze the data, how to argue for the validity and rigor of what we were doing. Um, so we, we muddled our way through, but the, the, the network is really an effort to um, sort of more, more coherently uh, develop critical understandings of these kind of participatory making activities by bringing people together to share their experiences, the challenges they've encountered and their ideas for how, how these things can develop. Great, that's really interesting to hear. So you've talked a lot about um, the kinds of you know methods and in obvious ways I think these are very material but I just wondered if you could speak, speak maybe a bit more explicitly to that because um, obviously this is a series of conversations on material methods so either material methods as using materiality to as a method or methods to understand materiality could you speak just a bit more specifically to how stitching together might be understood as a kind of material method or series of material methods? Mm, sure. Um, well, yes, I mean, we think there are lots of links with the ideas, Sophie, that you've developed around material methods. Um, making textiles with other people can be a really productive way of understanding their experiences of that activity sort of in the moment. Mm -hmm. So it's a way of being able to capture um, people's reflections, their thoughts, their um, responses in the moment, uh, rather than waiting until afterwards in a very different setting and collecting that data, for example. Um, it's an efficient way for to, to, as Amy was doing, to, to explore ways of learning how people um, learn to practice a craft, learn to knit or learn to sew. Um, it can also bring out all sorts of insights into um, experiences related to textiles, but, but not necessarily just making textiles. It could be insights into experiences of owning textiles or using textiles in a daily basis, living with textiles more broadly. Um, that could be in both a social setting or a, a cultural context. Um, and perhaps less obviously, uh, we're finding that participatory textile making activities can also be used to investigate things which aren't directly linked either to craft making activities or textiles, because they're, they're, they're so good at creating a space for rich dialogue and exploring the granular detail of a particular area of interest. Um, they're, they're methods that really get into the corners of people's lives that, that perhaps some other methods can't. So um, to give a, an illustration of this, perhaps, uh, the work of Rian Solomon, 
uh, an artist, maker, designer. Um, she's initiated collaborative workshops with breast reconstruction patients and surgeons to as a place to facilitate dialogue around um, these very different perspectives of illness and treatment for breast cancer. Um, so, so yeah, there are lots of ways I think that these methods connect with uh, your idea of material methods. Yeah, I mean, I can see that. And I'm really interested in what you're saying at the end about how, you know, it can give you insight into all sorts of other things that maybe you wouldn't expect. And, you know, it's not just about, obviously, clothing in itself is a fascinating thing, but also it's such an interesting route methodologically into all sorts of other things. So, yeah, really interesting. And that kind of feeds into a question I'd like to ask actually about disciplines and disciplinarity, because I think by definition, like material methods are interdisciplinary. We, you know, so many different disciplines that they fall within and I think that's a really interesting thing to think about how much particular methods are specific to disciplines or how much they are able to translate or speak across so I wondered if you could answer that in terms of your own disciplinary backgrounds and how much you think the kind of methods that you develop through stitching together are particular to that or kind of translate beyond discipline. Oh, yeah it's a really really good question so we both teach fashion and textiles and we both research within an art and design context so for us, there's a, a really kind of clear link between the making methods that we're discussing and the, the kind of topics that we're researching and the, the things that we're teaching. Um, so, for example, my current research is about imagining alternative fashion systems using clothes and textiles as a tool in that process. Um, but one of the most striking things about participatory textile making is how it's being used by people from very different disciplinary backgrounds. And that's what we kind of are unearthing more and more and more through the, the work of the network is we oh we think we know that it's quite diverse and then more people come along and we're like whoa okay it's it's even more diverse than we we thought um and we think that's probably because textile making is such a widespread accessible and flexible activity so it's kind of relevant to people's lives in so many different ways that, that it, it it kind of um makes it so flexible um and you can do textile making in a very, um, it's very easy to set up. You don't need a lot of stuff. So it can be very kind of accessible in terms of um, people having a go with this. So a few examples just to kind of illustrate that diversity. Um, the work of Jessica Jacobs. So she's a geographer and a filmmaker who's been exploring approaches to mapping tribal boundaries in the Middle East. And she hit a barrier of gender bias. So in a community that restricts women's interactions in public, she wasn't reaching them with the filmmaking methods that she was using and, kept, and came up with the idea of using embroidery as an alternative way of um, kind of accessing women's perspectives. Um, the work of Marana, so her doctoral research is in the field of psychology um, and she's exploring the value of craft in dementia care. So closer to craft, but definitely uh, very much within the discipline of, of psychology. Um, and then another example, which is about, I suppose, different disciplines working together. Uh, so Stephanie Bunn, who's a, a social anthropologist, um, did a case study uh, for us recently, um, a really interesting project where she'd been working with colleagues from a whole range of disciplines to investigate the mathematics of basketry making and their kind of making together and, you know, bringing those, those different very different areas of knowledge together through the process of making. Great. I mean, it's really interesting to hear that kind of diversity and how much, you know, I mean, I am currently a sociologist, but I have worked in art and design as well, but I can certainly see how, how many things it speaks to even within disciplines like social science disciplines. And I think that's something that I think a lot of people who watch this will be social scientists and I think they'll be really interested in thinking about it from lots of different perspectives and um, you know like sociology or anthropology certainly and um, which you mentioned a little bit so then the last question I'd like to ask is um what do you think the future of the method is where, where do you think this could lead um kind of after this we've heard a lot about what you've done but I'd be really interested to think about where you think it could be going Yes, and I think we've also indicated that there's, you know, there is a lot, a lot more that can be developed. Um, I mean, 
to start with, as we've said already, um, I think we'd call it more of an approach rather than strictly just a method because there is so much diversity, both in the format, um, the scale of these works, the reach, the tools, the techniques, the contexts, um, and of course the research questions. Um, it's a very vibrant area of research that, that we've discovered and there is a lot of enthusiasm from all those who've, who've been working with us on, in the network for doing more research in this area and for using this approach um, in, in research. Um, we currently have over 60 network members and as Amy's indicated as well from across a very wide range of disciplinary backgrounds. Um, plus additional contributors, critical friends, and interested collaborators. So there's there's willingness and enthusiasm there, but there is a real need to to develop uh, stronger critical understandings, both about the doing of it, but also about um, how it how these approaches can be used and developed. Um, also to discuss. Uh, the, the many challenges that arise, because yes, there are lots of lots of really um, exciting and positive contributions that people are making, but there are challenges that do arise when you're researching in this way, and um, we are doing some thinking around this. Um, for example, people working with vulnerable groups. Uh, using textile making methods. This could this can present ethical challenges, of course, they need to be thought about really carefully. Um, disseminating research findings that are actually embedded in creative and expressive media, you know, that presents a challenge for, for researchers as well. And also maintaining the integrity of the project as research, whilst at the same time keeping all these multiple partners happy in a project, that's a challenge. Um, so there's a lot of work that's still to do, I think, in, in those areas. And one of the key outputs of the network, um, the Stitching Together Network, which we hope will help with some of this, is our new Good Practice Guidelines document. Um, the guidelines provide advice for facilitators of participatory textile making workshops and projects, both in research context, but also in non-research settings. So for example, working in com community groups with art centers and so on. These have been, uh, these guidelines have been informed by input from over 30 network members and critical friends, uh, drawing on, you know, a whole range of experiences and a lot of stored knowledge. Um, so that's very exciting. Um, they, the guidelines themselves cover and give advice uh, around all sorts of things from devising the making activities in the first instance and thinking about what resources might be needed right through to the dissemination and the aftercare, um, both the aftercare of the project, but also um, the aftercare of, of the research. Um, and all the way through, there's an emphasis on ethical practice and inclusivity. So uh, we have done lots of learning. There is more to do along with the publication. Uh, we'll be continuing to coordinate opportunities for network members and others to come together and share experiences, talk about the methods and the approaches that they've used. And we're very keen for people to use the good practice guidelines in their practice and to feed back to us. So we've, we've conceived these as a, a foundational structure for these types of activities. But um, of course, it's a starting point. We want to encourage innovation, flexibility in the application of these, these methods. And then of course, we want to hear about it, we want to see you know, where can these go? How can we develop this further? So it's very exciting. Lots of work still to do, that's for sure. That's great. I think it, I think the good practice guidelines will be brilliant actually, because I imagine there's a lot of people who are super interested, but not really sure how to maybe do it. And I think particularly coming from social sciences, and I think that'll be really, um, really helpful for them. So that's really good to hear. Um, okay, well, thanks very much. It's been really interesting to hear, uh, hear from Stitching Together, and uh, I think we'll all really look forward to hearing what happens next. So thank you very much.